Known by its people as Druk Yul, meaning Land of the Thunder Dragon, the Kingdom of Bhutan lies in the eastern Himalayas, sandwiched between China to the north and India to the south. Our visit in the spring of 2018 was arranged and led by David Bishop, a pioneer of birding trips to Bhutan, supported by a really excellent ground crew from Gangri Tours. Our connecting flight from Bangkok provided brief views of the Himalayas before we descended along a steep valley to the international airport at Paro. The birding began almost as soon as we left the airport. Initially it was a shikra, flying over the river, that warranted a stop. Then we found a family of plumbeous water red starts. Note the plain grey mantle and crown of the female. Only the male has the classic red start tail. Juveniles are obviously speckled. Like the adult female, juveniles also have no red, but rather white on the upper tail coverts and tail sides. There was also our first of many black bull bulls. Eventually we continued on, arriving at our first night's accommodation at the lovely Hotel Druchen. The outlook showed how much the airport dominates this part of the Paro Valley with views across to the mountains and Paro's Rinpong Zong. After lunch we headed out along the river north of the city. Unfortunately the hoped for ibis bills were not on view, but we did find a much more obliging river lapwing, another wader that prefers these open and fast flowing rivers. There were also white wagtails. Here they are of the white-faced form, also known as Himalayan wagtail. A black mantle on this individual shows it to be a male, females being much greyer. Alongside the river we came across a few olive-backed pipits. A buff tone to the face and breast and a relatively plain mantle identified them as belonging to the northern subspecies Unanensis, a migrant here, rather than of the resident Himalayan form. And lots of oriental turtle doves. An abundant roadside bird throughout the trip. Further up river we found a pair, with the female enticing the male to mate. Blue whistling thrush was another common species first seen here. As were grey-backed shrikes. Green-backed tit. And russet sparrow. A few white-collared blackbirds were around, but only this female showed well. We continued further up the valley to the Druk Gyel Zong, currently being rebuilt, and to a viewpoint across to the famous Tiger's Nest Monastery.
a rufous-breasted accenter, was seen in a small scrubby area nearby, typically foraging on the ground. Black-tailed crake is a major target bird in this part of the Paro Valley. As one moved on, a pair then appeared and amazingly began duetting. As darkness descended, we returned to our hotel. Our destination the next day was Timpu, however not via the direct route, but instead by heading west over the Chale La Pass. We left before dawn in less than welcoming weather. Nonetheless, our first stop was successful, as we eventually got good spotlighted views of a grey nightjar. From the van, we spotted a fine male grey-winged blackbird. and a few domesticated yaks. There were also more familiar cattle, whose ticks were sought after by a pair of yellow-billed blue magpies. They can be shy, so maybe the poor weather attempted them into the open. They proved to be fairly common in these mid-altitude forests. Despite their name, they are only really blue on the upper tail. In the same area, pretty Primula candelariana were new in flower. We also saw our first chestnut-bellied rock thrush, a male perched on top of a pine tree, and a rufous sibia. As we got higher, the rain turned to sleet and snow. A Himalayan blue tail appeared at the forest edge. Despite the short burst of song, it was clearly a female. Callage pheasants can be relatively common at these higher elevations, often feeding close to the road. This is a female. Males of the different races are quite variable, these in western Bhutan having extensive white on the breast and flanks. Blood pheasants are much rarer and given the conditions, we were pleased when a male wandered into view. Males of this western form are greenish-yellow below, with little red on the breast. A female also put in a brief appearance. Close to the summit, we finally ventured out of the van. A mixed flock of tits included coal tits, very different from the familiar subspecies in Western Europe, and very similar rufous vented tits. Duskier below than the coal tits, and with no pale wing bars. The pale rufous vent is really hard to see in poor light. Thankfully, the call is noticeably different. There were also a few quieter and less obtrusive grey crested tits. At nearly 4,000 metres, the pass is the highest drivable point in Bhutan and presumably has fabulous views.
descending the west side of the pass, there was no improvement in the weather. The sleet turned to rain, but at least we were finally able to explore on foot, including at an open area with scrub as well as forest habitat. A pair of olive-backed pipits were more heavily streaked below than those seen at Paro, and were probably the nominate form that breeds in the Himalayas. A rufous-breasted accenter perched out in the open, and then the first of two male blue-fronted red starts was found foraging on the ground. A second male performed superbly to the sound of cowbells ringing in the background. There was also a pair of white-collared blackbirds and rather more distantly, a male white-winged grosbeak. As we dropped down towards the Har Valley, there was at long last a break in the clouds. A new range of species appeared on the outskirts of Har, including red-billed chuff, and a pair of white-throated laughing thrushes. One was carrying food, as if waiting to visit its nest. Beyond the town, an immature black eagle broke cover close to the road. Despite their size, they are highly manoeuvrable and specialise in hunting around the tree canopy. Now heading back east, we stopped for lunch overlooking the valley, where a Himalayan buzzard was soaring at eye level. And there were a few southern nutcrackers around. They can be separated from the now split northern species by being much less spotted with a distinctive brown crown and more white in the tail. Nearby, a mixed flock revealed our first white-browed fulvetters and a quite superb Mrs Gould's sunbird. The males are exquisite, crimson above and yellow below with a purple crown and purplish blue tail. Also green-backed tits. These are the Asian equivalent of the more northerly and westerly great tit. Continuing on, another stop produced this ashy drongo, the common roadside drongo in Bhutan. Plus a yellow-billed blue magpie with what looked like a beetle. Another mixed flock was dominated by oriental white eyes. And our first male red-headed bullfinch. And long-tailed minivet. Also a female green-tailed sunbird, similar to Mrs Gould's, but with a longer bill and no yellow on the rump. Later from the van, we watched a spotted laughing thrush foraging by the road. Unusual behaviour, as they are normally very shy.
The journey also included a couple of sites for brown parrotbill. They were found at both, but proved exceptionally hard to see well. After a long day, we then carried on to Timpu. The following morning, we drove through Timpu, past the Royal Palace, and on towards Jigme Dorji National Park. On the way, we stopped along the river near Bagana. This was a stakeout for yellow rumped honey guide, and a male was duly located watching over a large rock bee's nest. In the same area was a male Mrs. Gould's sunbird. And chestnut crowned laughing thrushes. Despite the name, the Bhutanese race does not have an all chestnut crown. The top of the head being grey. Just up river was an impressive mural of the Guru Rinpoche, who first brought Buddhism to Bhutan. We headed on uphill. The approach road followed the course of the Timpu River, home to a beautiful white capped red start. and a pair of plumbeous water red starts. Both were collecting food for nestlings hidden nearby. A bug carrying Eurasian hoopoo was presumably also nesting under an old barn. And a grey-backed shrike was skulking in a riverside bush finally venturing into the open. Up river, a monastery clung to the hillside in typical Bhutanese fashion. A bridge led across to the monastery where another male plumbeous water red start was singing from a low flagpole. This was also the entrance to the National Park, and at last a view of the higher peaks. The weather held out for breakfast, interrupted by a herder with his pack horses. Unfortunately, the cloud cover returned as we gained more altitude. The boreal forest here was dominated by subalpine conifers, favoured by two species of tree creeper. Firstly, at least two rusty flanked tree creepers. And Eurasian tree creeper. The form here often split as Hodgson's and even then again as Brooks tree creeper. In the understory, we found two different male Rufus gorgeted flycatchers. This one showed best, as the rufous throat patch can often be hard to see. And another mixed flock, attracted by David's collared owl imitation, including rufous vented euhenias, whose rufous vent is much less obvious than its rufous nape. 
and stripe-throated euhenias with their distinctive forward-facing crest. Plus frenetically active Blythe's leaf warblers. And yellow-bellied fantail. The best bird here though was undoubtedly this spectacular male Himalayan monal. It was wary and always never quite full in view, but having been missed at Chalala in the poor weather the previous morning, this was a most welcome appearance. With bird activity tailing off, we descended back towards Timpu. Our appropriately named hotel looked out across the river towards the city. Where we spent a few hours wandering in the afternoon. dawn we were at the top of the pass at Dochula. Clouds again obscured any views of the mountains. Birds in this high rhododendron zone included a female golden bush robin identified by yellow in the tail. Another male rufous gorgeted flycatcher and a pair of Darjeeling woodpeckers. The male with red on the nape. And the female with an all black crown. We headed slowly down the east side of the pass, locating our first langurs of the trip. These are the mountain form of common langur. They have a complex taxonomy and are also known as either Grey Langer or Hanuman Langer, although these larger Himalayan forms are now often treated as a separate species, the Nepal Grey Langer. Some short lived breaks in the cloud began to develop, and a male chestnut bellied rock thrush was enjoyed in better light. As at Chalila, it was again perched in a pine tree. A pair of green-tailed sunbirds. Confusingly, the race in Bhutan has a metallic blue tail. Plenty more grey-backed shrikes. plus coal tits. And Blythe's leaf warblers. A green crowned warbler. And a yellow browed tit. Lower down, we stopped for breakfast at a botanical garden. with white-throated laughing thrushes feeding by the entrance. And a large hawk cuckoo, showing well but being subsumed within an enveloping mist. East of the pass, from Wangdi Podrang, 
we headed north to Punaka, where two rivers, the Mochu and the Pochu, meet. Punaka is also the site for Bhutan's most impressive song. Its Bhutanese name means the Palace of Great Happiness. It's open to the public and accessed by a bridge over the Mo Chu. Below the bridge, a brown dipper was seen. Built in the mid 17th century, it is the second oldest and second largest song in Bhutan. The senior clergy of Bhutan and their entourage of monks spend the winter months here. Once inside the courtyard, our local guide Ergen led us on a fascinating tour. South of the Zong, we searched the river and its extensive stony islets, finding a flock of ruddy shellduck. More unexpected was a resting common shellduck amongst them. And then at last, a superb ibis bill. Thankfully it allowed a reasonably close approach as it preened, and then began feeding. We then drove north along the Po Chu Valley in a search for the rare and elusive white-bellied heron. No heron, but we did find a river lapwing looking after a chick. This stunning male long-tailed minivet was one of a number of passerines also found along the valley. along with a male oriental magpie robin, a black bulbul, a pair of preening grey tree pies, and finally excellent views of a small flock of lovely black-throated bush tits. we set up camp along the river, our first of an enjoyable few nights under canvas. After an early breakfast, we searched again for the white-bellied heron along the Pochu. No luck, maybe due to increasing settlement along the valley. Consolation though, in the discovery of a pair of palaces fish eagles, a globally threatened species that still finds sanctuary in Bhutan's mountain valleys. Heading back towards Punaka, we also found an obliging crested kingfisher, a species that can be elusive here. And a male blue whistling thrush. A few dried up paddy fields produced appropriately enough this paddy field pipit.
and chestnut tailed starlings. South of Punaka, the wide valley of the Puna Sanchu lies in a rain shadow and is well known for migrants. Scanning the river revealed plenty of ruddy shelduck, fairly common in winter and on passage. But also more uncommon visitors, such as northern pintails, Eurasian widgeon, even a couple of resting drake gargany, and quite rare here, a female common pochard. There was also a western osprey perched on a post. And common green shanks foraged around shallow pools. Residents included a striated prinia, and a male crested bunting. It was then a long drive south along the Puna Tsangchu Valley. A male slender-billed oriole was a meagre highlight in the typically rather birdless chirpine forests. Leaving the valley behind, we turned off east, making our way towards our next camp at Darachu. Poor weather again hampered our birding, but there was still much to see in the mid-altitude forests along the way. This was prime habitat for great barbets. They were constantly calling to partners or to other individuals across the valley. Also this female greater yellow nape, one of a pear scene. more ashy drongos, Eurasian tree creeper, another surprisingly approachable large hawk cuckoo, and a collared owlet, doing a very good impression of David Bishop. This is the call David uses to attract mixed flocks. It worked here too, pulling in whiskered euhenias, black chinned euhenias, and a grey hooded warbler, joined by a lovely silver eared messier. By early evening, we had settled into our camp for the night. <laughs> 